In our last lesson, we learned that when Jesus comes again, He's going to judge the world in righteousness. God has appointed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom He hath ordained, whereof He hath given assurance unto all men in that He hath raised Him from the dead. The Lord's appearing was associated with accountability, with giving account of our stewardship, standing before Him and giving account for the deeds done in the body, whether they be good or whether they be evil. You are a steward of God. Maintain your stewardship faithfully till the Lord comes. Then you will give an account of your stewardship. In this lesson, we want to admonish you to be ready for the appearing of the Lord. The truth of Christ's return is not to be ignored. This is, in fact, the blessed hope of the church. Paul tells us there's only one hope in Ephesians, the fourth chapter. And this is it that we're talking about. The one hope is the appearance of a great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of that great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Titus 2, verse 13. Without this hope, there's no purpose for our existence in the faith. What some have chosen to call the Christian life is futile and pointless and vain if Jesus is not coming back again. But he is coming back to receive us unto himself that where he is, there we may be also. When we maintain the doctrine of the appearing of the Lord, the second coming of the Lord, as some have said, it is not just a mere cold orthodoxy that we're maintaining. It's our hope. If this is not alive in our hearts, our faith will dissipate and wane. We will become cold and lifeless. We must cling to this hope, holding it steadfastly. The scriptures represent Jesus Christ at this present time as expecting. Hebrews the 10th chapter and verse 13 says that he is from henceforth, from the time of his exaltation on, expecting, looking forward to the termination of all things when his people will be brought to him and when the grand drama of redemption shall have been complete. If he's expecting, why shouldn't we? Well, the blessed hope of the church brings us into the picture. It makes us expectants also. Jesus said this in Luke, the 12th chapter, in verse 40. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh in an hour that you think not. And let me ask you, are you in the number that are looking for the appearing of the Lord or that think not that He is going to appear? Beware, in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. So be ready. Ready against the day. Let's look for a moment at the concept of readiness. Just what is it? To be ready is to make the appropriate preparation for the coming of the Lord. Is to live in a lively cognition of Christ's coming. Cognition is awareness. A keen sensitivity that the Lord is coming again. To be ready is to live in that state of mind is to be aware of the fact that right now we're in the land of jeopardy and danger. There are pitfalls all around us, opportunities to fall, opportunities to sin, opportunities to depart from the faith, opportunities to give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. To help alleviate this situation, we are looking for the coming of the Lord and making the appropriate preparations. Be ready. For the appearing of the Lord. At the appearing of the Lord, we are determined not to let our house be broken up. We do not want to have taken from us the things that we have appropriated and spent our energies to appropriate. Jesus said, The wise man, a good and a faithful wise man, if he knows the thief is coming, will not suffer his house to be broken up. All right, Jesus has told us he's coming. He's told us he's coming unexpectedly, that not even he knows when he's going to come back. When he comes back, therefore, he says, don't let your house be broken up. Invest in things that are eternal. Set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. And if you feel uncomfortable with heavenly things here, what makes you think you'd feel comfortable with them there? Readiness involves becoming oriented to heaven right now. Feeling at home in the Lord's presence here. After all, when Jesus comes, he is going to disrupt completely the natural order. 
In the day he comes as a thief in the night, Peter said, the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. The work all, worth also and the works that are therein will be burned up. And Peter says, seeing that all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to be in all manner of godly conversation or manners of life? There are in Scripture some examples of readiness, people that were ready for what was coming. It may be profitable for us to review very briefly some of these. Take, for instance, Noah. There's a man that needed to be ready. God told him in 120 years he was going to destroy the world with a flood. The world had never seen a flood before, hadn't even seen rain before. The scriptures tell us the earth is watered from a mist beneath. Noah was given some dimensions and procedures to build an ark to the saving of his house. Commenting on this situation in Hebrews 11, verse 7, the Holy Spirit says, And Noah prepared an ark by faith to the saving of his house, whereby he condemned the world. Noah made preparations, and the day the rain started, the ark was done. The animals were in, his family was in, and the door was shut. Now you've got time to build an ark to make ready for the coming of the Lord. Don't let Noah outstrip you. Be ready when the judgment day comes. Another classic example of readiness is that of Israel when they were delivered from Egyptian bondage. Speaking of Moses as a representative of the entire nation, Hebrews eleven twenty eight 28 says that by faith he kept the Passover lest he should be destroyed to the destroyer. In the night the angel of death swept over the nation of Egypt, taking the firstborn of every household. Israel had made the appropriate preparations. They'd slain a lamb, they'd eaten the meat, they'd daubed the blood on the doorpost, and they were ready to go, their staffs in their hand, their loins girt, and the sandals on their feet. Ready for deliverance. Well, when Jesus comes, we're going to be delivered from this present evil world in the fullest sense. Grace gets us ready for the day. And as we bid a fond adieu and farewell to this present evil world, we'll rise to forever be with the Lord. Are you ready? Like Israel was ready. Another man that was ready was Lot. Lot lived in Sodom. It was the first town filled with homosexuals. To let us know what God thinks about that erroneous style of life, God burned up the city. Left a pit there, salt sea. There's a testimony that he does not and will not and cannot approve of that sort of perversion. The scriptures tell us that Lot vexed his righteous soul with the conversation or manner of life of the wicked. 2 Peter 2, 7. It irritated Lot to live there. He stood in the gate, the scriptures tell us, and condemned people. When time came for the city to be burned up, Lot was ready. His affection had been uprooted, and he was ready to be delivered. Think of Daniel, the prophet, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three Hebrew children. They were ready. When the test came, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were confronted with a governmental challenge. A law came out that they were to bow down before an image that had been created by the king, and at the sound of all sorts of instruments of music, they were to worship. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were ready for the day. They lived in conscious fellowship with their God, availing themselves of the resources that were available then, and when the sound of the dulcimer and sack button flute sounded, they refused to bow. They were ready when they went into the fiery furnace. They also came out because they were ready. Daniel was ready for the lion's den. When the government come out and said, don't pray, he went on praying anyway with his window open. Make sure everybody saw. When he was thrown in the lion's den, he was ready. How about you? Are you ready for the coming of the Lord? Or are you like some of those that were not ready? of which Scripture informs us. Matthew, the 24th chapter, verses 38 and 39, hearken back to the time of the flood. Jesus said they were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were giving in marriage, and they knew not till the flood came and took them all away. They weren't ready for the coming of the flood. 
He said, that's the way it's going to be. When I come, there's going to be a lot of people that aren't ready. May God help you not to be among that number. One other person that wasn't ready, I think frequently of, was Lot's wife. Lot made it to the city of refuge, but uh, his wife didn't. She wasn't ready. Her heart hadn't been uprooted from Sodom. She turned back and looked back at the city, and the scripture tells us she was turned into a pillar of salt, an epitaph to unbelief. Jesus points his prophetic finger back, and he says, Remember, Lot's wife, when you come away from the world, take your heart out of it too. Because if your heart's not away from the world, you won't be ready when Jesus comes any more than Lot's wife was ready when deliverance was available to her. Now let's think of the logic of readiness. It's reasonable to be ready. This is not an unreasonable demand. The appearance of the Lord is uncertain. We don't know what day or hour He's going to come. Not the angels, not man, not even the Son of Man knows. Mark 13, verses 32 through 35 tells us. So it's uncertain when He's going to come. That mandates consistent and continual readiness. Now you've got to be ready. And from now on you've got to be ready. Because we don't know at what hour our Lord shall appear. Be ye therefore ready, Jesus said. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. Jesus, depicting the time when he is going to appear, provided us the parable of the five wise and five foolish virgins. An intriguing statement is made in that parable in Matthew, the 25th chapter, in verse 10. When the bridegroom came, it said, they that were ready went in, and the door was shut, and nobody else got in. When Jesus comes, you won't have a millennium of time to get ready. You won't have a year or two to get ready. You'll either be ready when he comes, or you'll be shut out of eternity with him. Be you also ready. Now it makes sense to be ready. The time of preparation and orientation is right now. Right now, the Philippian letter tells us in the third chapter, verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven, from whence we look for our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Right now is a time when we're getting set for the world to come. We're uprooting our affections from this world and planting them in the world to come. We're taking our treasures from this world and laying them up to the world to come. It makes sense to be ready if this world's going to pass away. Not only that, but everything belongs to you that is required to get ready. God hasn't left us bereft of the resources. He has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 1, 3 states, And everything belongs to us. Makes no difference whether it's Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. All things are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ is God's. 1 Corinthians 3, 21 through 23. If anybody has everything working for them, it's you. Everything's been given to you. Your name's on every divine resource. God's even said, if you lack wisdom, ask of me, and I'll give you liberally. And I won't chew you out for asking. I'll upbraid you not. Now, how can you lose with a situation like that? If you just avail yourself of what's been provided... You can have what Peter calls an abundant entrance into the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's another good reason to be ready. Hebrews 13 and verse 6 tells it. It says, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Now, listen, the Lord's your helper too. He'll help you get ready. It only remains for you to want to be ready. There's been a divine commitment given to everyone that's in Christ Jesus. Here it is. He said, The second time he shall appear without sin to them that look for him. So if you're looking for him, and look there means anxiously anticipating, stretching over the precipice of time, leaning toward the day, refusing to let anything obscure my vision of the coming Christ. If that's your posture, Jesus will come back without sin for you. Here's another promise. The Apostle Paul says, I'm ready now to be offered. That is to say, to die. 
Wherefore henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give to me, and not to me only, but to all they that love his appearing. Do you love his appearing? Is it hard for you to get it out of your mind? Does it delight your soul? Open the door for hope and expectation? Warm your spirit? If it does, crown of righteousness is going to be given to you. That's a divine commitment. It'll be given to everyone that loves his appearing. While the world is shaking and quaking and crying for rocks and mountains to fall on them, those that love his appearing will say, this is our God, he's come to save us. Praise God for the day. You'll receive a crown of righteousness, and it'll be a big one. Make no mistake about that. The you know, Lord tells us in 1 Thess Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, that we are to wait for the Son from heaven, whom God raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Ah, there's wrath coming all right. It's going to destroy the ungodly. It's going to destroy the world. It's going to destroy the heavens. Stars are going to fall out of their sockets. The sun turned to darkness, the moon to blood, speaking prophetically. The whole natural order is going to dissipate. People that have done wickedness are going to be ostracized, cut off from the presence of God. We're waiting for a Savior that's delivered us from that wrath to come. And if you're waiting for Him patiently, looking for Him, you'll have no part of wrath. Instead, you'll enter into the joy of the Lord. You see, the whole economy of grace is designed to prepare you for the coming of the Lord. It's just not merely to get your sins remitted. That's a starting point, not an ending point. That gets you ready to start into the real work of the kingdom, which is to get ready for the return of the Lord. Now, there is in Scripture a mandate, an absolute requirement for readiness. Matthew 24, verse 44 says, Be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Now, receive that word. Don't push it from you. Don't let it frighten you. This is Jesus, your Savior, that's speaking this. This is the one that laid down his life a ransom for many, that was delivered up for our offenses and raised for our justification. He's proved he loves you, that he wants the best thing for you. Now he says to you, now be ready. I don't want you not to be ready. I don't want you in a state of unreadiness when I come. I want you to be with me, so be ready. For I am coming in an hour that you expect not. One way to be ready for the coming of the Lord is to be spiritually minded. That is to say that you can think the thoughts of the Holy Spirit in harmony with Him. The Bible is not a strange book to you, not foreign to your thinking processes. Romans the 8th chapter and verse 6 tells us this, To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And the word of God carnal means fleshly, earthy, of this earth order. If a person is carnally minded, thinks like a man, thinks like the world, doesn't think like God, that's death. In that state, he's cut off from God. God and him are not together. As Amos said, how can two walk together except to be agreed? God can't walk with you if you're not in agreement with him. Don't let anyone fool you on this. Don't be mistaken at this point. If you're, so to speak, at loggerheads with God in your thinking, you can't walk with Him. God only walks with people that agree with Him. You may not be able to plumb the depths of everything He's said, but you ought to be able to say Amen to everything that God has said. That's to be spiritually minded. And to be spiritually minded is life, connection with God. What we call reciprocity. Reciprocity means when God talks, you hear. And when God works, you see. And when God moves, you understand. You respond to Him, as well as Him responding to you. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. To those that are spiritually minded, here's what will happen when Jesus comes again. Their life will not be disrupted. Say, there's a challenging thought, isn't it? Think of it. Your life will not be interrupted. It will be enhanced. When Jesus comes, you'll actually have more of what you've already got now. The things for which you've developed a spiritual appetite will be brought to you. I have a vision like this in my soul of when the Lord Jesus Christ appears 
and His kingdom appears with Him. All these wonderful things that are unseen to mortal eye now have become visible. If you live by grace, you'll be able to say this, this is just what I wanted, and it's just the way I knew it'd be. He's readying you for living with Him forever. Spiritual mindedness or spiritual readiness is being able right now to make the move into the eternal world without trauma, without disruption. That's what the scripture means when it says, then we will be glad with exceeding joy. At last we're going to get what we want, 100%. We are our appetites having been developed by grace. Now the parables of our Lord Jesus Christ illustrate these truths very graphically. Take for instance the parables of the talents and of the pounds. These men, some of them were ready, some were not ready to give an accounting to the Lord. Remember, our text said, Be ye therefore ready also, for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh. The parable of the talents and the pounds, there were a number of stewards to whom the master gave his goods. He came back to reckon with them, they just didn't know when he was coming back. One man, for instance, with five talents said, Lord, look here. The five talents you gave me have increased to ten talents. The Lord said, well done, good and faithful servants. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. Be over ten cities. Another man said, look here, you two talents. They've gained two more. He said, well done, good and faithful servant. Commended him. Ah, but there was that one. Probably like some of you. He didn't really waste what he had. He didn't destroy what he had. He didn't even give it to somebody else. Instead, he wrapped it up in a napkin, real neat, buried it. Told the Lord, he said, I knew you were an austere man, reaping where you didn't sow, gathering when you had not scattered. So here it is, Lord, just like you gave it to me. I haven't increased it, and I haven't diminished it. I haven't improved it, and I haven't caused it to go downhill. Here it is. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said that servant was condemned. The talent he did have was taken from him and given to the man who had ten talents. He said, because of what you're not, if you're not faithful over what's been given to you, it'll be taken away from you. Now listen to me. I know in my heart, not because I have mystical powers, but because I'm a man and I've lived in this world, I know that there's some of you that haven't done a thing with what God's given you. You haven't improved it, you haven't tried to use it, you haven't increased it. You haven't participated in the great scheme of redemption. You've just sort of been a pew filler and a squatter. Instead of singing, standing on the promises, you've been sitting on the premises. Well, when Jesus comes again, you're going to have to give an account for maltreatment of his goods. Learn from that parable of the talent and the one of the pounds to use what God has given you. Everything in the kingdom is designed to make it grow and increase. There's the fruitless tree found in Luke the 13th chapter in verse 8. Jesus said that the man, uh, householder, returned and found this tree and no fruit was on it. He said, why is this tree cumbering the ground? It's taking up space, but there's no fruit there. Cut it down. The man said, no, no, let's give it a little more time. I'll dig around it and dung it or fertilize it. When you come again, if there's fruit on it, then we'll have spared the tree. If not, then we'll cut it down. Listen to me. Some of you are like that tree. You've been in the ground, taking up a lot of space, and you haven't been giving any fruit to God. God hasn't been getting glory out of your life. You've got space to repent right now. There's all the resources to start bringing forth fruit. In other words, to be ready when the householder returns. There, of course, is the parable of the rich fool that had an unusual crop increase. And instead of giving glory to God, he tore down his old barns and built new ones. One thing he didn't reckon on, God required a soul of him that night. This may be your night. Be ready for the return of the Lord in whatever form it takes, whether it's your death or whether you are alive and remain when he returns. I couldn't close this subject without mentioning this truth. When Jesus comes again, there's going to be no change in your character. 
No essential change will be made in your person when he comes. Revelation 22, verses 10 through 12 emphasize this. Let him that's filthy be filthy still. Let him that's unrighteous be unrighteous still. Let him that's holy be holy still. Let him that's righteous be righteous still. When you die, your character is set. It isn't going to be changed, not at all. You'll either be ready or not ready when the Lord comes. Make no mistake about this. There isn't any place in all God's Word where one spark of hope is held up for someone that's not ready, for someone that's not looking for His appearing, for someone that's not waiting for His appearing. If you're not ready, get ready. Start availing yourself of these opportunities. The lack of readiness means that you have not availed yourself of the atonement. That's why it's so serious. Jesus died to make you ready, and if you're not ready, you just simply haven't believed the gospel. It's just that simple. Christ died in vain, as far as you're concerned. Paul said, if righteousness come by the law, then is Christ dead in vain. You frustrated the grace of God if you're not ready. If you're not ready, you have quenched the Spirit of God who's trying to get you ready. If you're not ready, you have grieved the Spirit of God by which you're sealed in the day of redemption because He's trying to get you ready. It's the fruit of the Spirit, you know, that makes you ready. And if you'll let Him, He'll produce it in you. So not being ready is a serious, serious matter. You've frustrated God's grace. You've stopped your ears to the love of God. You've ignored the Lord Jesus Christ. You've ignored the gospel of Jesus Christ. Quench the Spirit. Grieve the Spirit. Stifle the Word of God. Close your eyes to the glorious promises and been distracted by the tinsels and baubles of this present evil world. Having said all that, such a foolish thing to do that when the table's been spread. All things are ready now. Come to the feast. Jesus has made the appropriate provisions for you to enter into glory. He's ready to come back, and everything about His salvation is designed to make you ready when He comes back. So now be up. Be doing the work of the Lord. Don't be lost eternally when Jesus has extended Himself to find you. Be faithful. And in your faithfulness, you'll be ready.